Given the time and the culture in which we live, and I mean that only in these most recent decades or century, we're a little bit out of touch for the most part with the ideal, the idea of the formal banquet. Not that we've never been to one. Maybe most of us grew up in a household where we always ate dinner together as a family. But in as much as that is becoming a lost art, very few people today are aware the full force of what these parables are talking about. Maybe you went to someone's particular wedding, some particular anniversary, something that sticks out in your mind as having this very formal seating arrangement. But if it was a wedding, well, at least mostly today, you make sure people get assigned seats. So you can make sure that that, you know, that one aunt isn't too close to that other aunt or that uncle or whatever. But in antiquity, this was a regular daily occurrence, not just for the wealthy and powerful, but the idea of the family dinner around the table. And unless you were extraordinarily poor and extraordinarily outcast, extraordinarily lower class, you existed together with your extended family. It wasn't quite like it had been in the days of the patriarch, but you wouldn't live under one roof, just husband and wife and then children and occasional grandparent. Rather, you would live where the grandparents and the parents and the children and the grandkids would all live together. Therefore, every nightly family meal where everybody did sit down at a table and there was no television yet, went just like this, everybody sat in a particular order. There was a head of the table, there was a spot for mom or the matriarch of the family, and so on. This is all a regular, ordinary part of the culture, however, also when the wealthy, the powerful, the important, and the influential would flaunt and show off their prosperity and bring in their political and doctrinal allies from the various sects and movements and clusters of people. You would have these banquets at various people's homes on a regular dinner time schedule and everybody would jockey for a position of who had the ear of which rabbi or which priest or which wealthy businessman and always trying to find the place where you could sit closer and get their attention. What's important about this is twofold. There's a very basic obvious message here. Don't judge a book by its cover. The people in the gospel reading have set Jesus up. You would not invite someone who was ritually unclean because they had dropsy to an event like this. They might huddle around outside hoping for a glimpse, especially those open air sorts of parts of homes in this part of the world, in this era, to see the important people, the poor people and the rejects being sort of the paparazzi of their time. But allowing this guy to get close is clearly premeditated because, as they have been doing, they're putting Jesus to the test. Will he heal this man on the Sabbath or not? And we are in that part of the gospel storyline where Jesus is increasingly short and testy with these people. He simply heals the man and instead of giving a very long explanation, says, which one of you wouldn't do the same? You break the Sabbath all the time when it's for a good cause because that's what you're supposed to do. I'm going to do it here. The real obvious message, don't judge a book by its cover, that God loves the guy with dropsy, he loves him enough to heal him on the Sabbath day, rules like that don't preempt doing good for one of your children that is suffering. And obviously we grew up in modern America we are filled with this message of don't judge a book by its cover. People from all backgrounds and nations and languages and socioeconomic classes, and that usually says nothing about the content of your character. The thing is, the gospel reading and the Proverbs in the Old Testament aren't really about that either. Yes, we should not judge a book by its cover. On the other hand, Jesus is not a revolutionary and he is not preaching a message of upsetting the order of society. He actually instructs us to know where we ought to sit and maybe don't think we should sit too close. Sit lower, 
because then maybe you'll be invited upward. Jesus doesn't say, as a follower of mine, you get rid of the table. Or worse yet, as Arthur did, make a round table so everyone is symbolically equal. Do this and undo all of the conventions of antiquity because it just isn't right to judge people or to judge their quality. Or rather, Jesus says it's perfectly normal, natural, and fine to be judging people according to their proximity to you, relationship-wise or anything else. It's your table. You get to set those rules. And when you're at someone else's table, you need to observe those rules. In fact, I can think of one time in our society where this has precisely the same gravitas as it did in antiquity, and that is the middle school cafeteria. When you first graduated on from elementary school and everybody's dividing up into who's jocks and who's nerds, and I remember the horrific existential horror of figuring out where you were gonna sit in the cafeteria. And I'm not just saying that as a joke, that really does happen. And we deal with it through high school. That I'm sure is still present in our society, whether we've ever eaten our Taco Bell at the same dinner table or not in our home. Jesus is not upsetting the order of things, but rather reminding us not to think more of ourselves than what we are. And so the twofold message, don't judge a book by its cover when you're judging other people, but also don't judge yourself as higher than you ought to be. Take the position of humility, because then the master of the feast may say, come up here instead of you go down there. It may seem like a small thing, but living as we do in a culture that is built around rugged individualism and individuals wanting to exalt themselves, wanting to make themselves so important, so important, their life story, their history, as if it were something cosmic. Celebrities, if you've noticed the last several years, have even started using this phrase, oh, I didn't want that scandal to be part of my story. I didn't want that relationship to be part of my story. I don't know what they think they're writing, but apparently they each believe their life is the next Ten Commandments or Ben-Hur and will be studied by future generations. This is the ego and arrogance of which the Lord is warning us about, not to think of ourselves as being too exalted and too high, lest we be brought down, lest we be humble, lest we be reminded that we are dirt and we came from dirt. It is the Lord who exalts. He is not preaching a revolution socially or culturally or religiously in reminding the Pharisees that it's fine to heal on the Sabbath. Rather, Jesus is doing what Jesus does, setting the cosmos into proper order. He is setting the cosmos into proper order by coming into flesh like ours and living obediently under the law of God the way that we can't because of our frailty. He is submitting himself he who is cosmic eternal, in whose image we are made, who made us out of the dirt and breathed life into us at the beginning, is humbling himself to be subjected to these Pharisees and scribes who try to trick him and conspire against him, these people with all this hatred in their heart for him. He subjects himself to all of this to live like one of us in the muck and filth of this world in every way but our individual sinfulness. Jesus submits himself to this though he is God Almighty, because he wishes to exalt us. When we exalt ourselves, we are not open, not receptive, not able to be exalted by him. When we exalt ourselves, we make ourselves to be God and ourselves to be judge of our own circumstances as we are wont to do. Christ comes into the world against all of our brokenness, our complete meritlessness, our complete unworthiness, Jesus comes into the world to exalt us according to his good and gracious will. Therefore, nothing about the structure, nothing about the organization, nothing about how the table at the wedding feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end, is structured, should be interpreted in any way unfair. Some will be at the rear and some will be at the fore. That is a mystery he mentions that we can't even begin to contemplate. But for him who is Lord and God, creator of the universe and master of the feast, 
and is also incarnate in the flesh like ours, being the bridegroom to the church. For him who has undone the power of sin, death, and the devil, broken the tombs, and emptied all of the graves by his power, for him, for him it lay to judge who sits where. He comes into the world, removing himself from his glory in order to elevate us. And all that he asks is that we sit quietly and allow him to elevate us even as he brings us forward to his table again to receive that which miraculously comes from his flesh and blood, even atonement, resurrection, and eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.